Good morning. Have you figured out that I'm not Carol? That probably didn't take very long. So, uh, welcome. It's good to be here with you. It's good to be worshiping together on this day. And it, I got to say, how gratified, I told the first service this, I'll tell you as well, how gratified I am to be a part of this family, this family of God, these sisters and brothers. You are a blessing to me, as I'm sure that you are a blessing to each other as well. It is a gift to be together, one that I think as the days and weeks and months go by gets more and precious to us. So let's celebrate the togetherness that we can have and, and also remember those folks who are not here, not with us, and how they are uh, uh, maybe feeling a little isolation, would maybe appreciate a phone call. Uh, just let folks know that you're thinking of them and praying for them. So uh, for all those folks at home, you are welcome as well uh, to be here with us in spirit. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the Psalms, Psalms 103 for our reading this morning. It's uh, in my Bible, it's one of the dog-eared passages, the underlying passages. That entire Psalm has so much richness in it. The uh, the page in my Bible is wrinkled from having been open out in the rain, which uh, reminds me of how much this this passage comes forward for me. But today I want to read the first five verses of this psalm. Um, if you have it, it's fine. If you don't, just listen to these words. David sings these words. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Pray with me. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, this life that you have placed us into is a life of struggle at times, particularly when we seek to do our own will and to go our own way. We stumble, we fall, we lose ourselves in the, the tangles of this world. Lord, draw us back to you. Help us to recognize your embrace. Help us not to forget your benefits, the forgiveness that you offer, the healing that you promise. Lord, you are good to us. We pray that you would be with us this morning as we worship together, both here in this place and dispersed throughout this community. We pray that you would touch each heart with a new understanding of your word. Give each voice that special something that is a sweet smell to you as we praise you and worship you. And draw us together, whether in body or in spirit, so that we might remember who we are, your precious children. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Sing uh, hymn number 100, Praise Him, Praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, oh, wonderful wealth proclaim. Hail, hail. Like a shepherd, <clears throat> name he carries them all day long. 
Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him. <clears throat> Sound His praises, Jesus who of unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. The portals, loud of His hosannas, Jesus, Savior, reign of the driver and ever. Crown him, crown him. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent grace. Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Please be seated. In place of the children's uh, time today, I've got a, a kind of an announcement or an explanation or so forth. I just want to kind of let you know where we are. As some of you realize, the state has moved from one stage to another, uh, recognizing the declining cases in COVID and, and the positive direction that our community is taking as far as, as, far as the, the virus is concerned. Um, last year, when we went from stage three to stage two, is that right? Stage three to stage, I'm getting them confused. Anyway, from one to the other, that was when we decided that we needed to kind of take a break from some of our meetings and the, the different things we were doing. And so now is the time for us to reconsider and, and think about opening some of these things up. Today we have a special opportunity to let the kids go down to Children's Church, um, which I know you've been very patient in listening to my sermons and, and taking very copious notes so that you could talk to your parents about. Yeah, that happened, didn't it? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um, but uh, we recognize that we want to have age-appropriate uh, activities and, and learning for our kids. So uh, Amber and Brittany have been willing to take today and and bring some of these young people down to, uh, to do that. So we are going to dismiss you to do that in a second, because I want to let you know about Sunday school too. We are in the process of, of putting, kind of getting things lined up for our Sunday schools. It may be a week or two before we're able to have uh, the, the teachers in place and the curriculum and so forth, but we are headed that direction. We just wanted to let you know about that um, so that uh, when the time comes, we'll, we'll put the word out and let you know what we're studying and how we're doing it. So uh, that is a positive thing. Continue in light of that. You know, apparently we're doing things correctly because <laughs> we're going the right direction with the virus. And so uh, keep up the good work in that. Be careful and sensitive to the folks that are around you. Um, so today, you guys get to go down there. Now you can go. So, and thank you, Brittany and Andrew, for being willing to lead this today. Oh, and if you want to come back for communion, you'll have to kind of pay attention to that. So we want to extend that invitation to our, especially our older kids as well. So. One ninety-four, and let's stand together again. Rescue the perishing, go here for the dying, snatch them for pity drunk. We pour them, lift of the fallen, tell them that Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. 
Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he only believe, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save, down, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore, touched by a loving heart, waken. Fire. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. For the labor thy Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently with them. Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Please be seated. Thanks, Dave. Mark chapter 1. I'd like to begin reading in the 29th verse of that first chapter of Mark. And again, Mark, I've noticed this over and over again, the, the staccato, the quick step, the, the, the moving from one thing to the next, and, and we have it here again. 29 begins, As soon, as soon as they left the synagogue... They went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. And so he went in, went to her, and took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Anachronism. I like that word. <laughs> anachronism. I think it's a great word, a wonderful word. An anachronism is something that's not in its right place, time-wise. Something that's out of time. Uh, it happens frequently in art. Uh, the artist depicts a scene that could not have happened chron chronologically. The, the ancient character wearing modern clothes, the, the radio in the medieval castle, airplanes flying over the pilgrims, that sort of thing. Sometimes anachronisms are subtle, and we don't really notice them. They're easily missed. When you watch a movie or a television show that's set, say, before 1960, then how many stars should there be on the American flag? Not 50, 48. Unless you go back further in time, then it might be even less. It might be a different type of flag entirely. Uh, that modern American flag that's flying over the log stockade in a, an old western, that's an anachronism. Now, a tricky thing with anachronisms is that they, they, we don't always see them. They are subtle at times, and we, they just kind of drift by in the, in the background. And, and this is particularly uh, troublesome or problematic when it comes to reading the Scriptures, learning from the Word, uh, interpreting what the Bible tells us. We need to understand how the original authors, the original audience, as best we can, how they would have understood the text and what they were saying and if we want to understand it most fully. 
Now, that's not to say that the Scriptures don't speak to every generation in new and fresh ways. It's just to caution us to be careful about these anachronisms, uh, projecting our understanding or our worldview into a world that would have never understood what we were thinking or how we saw things. It's easy for us to, to read a passage of Scripture and think that we understand it, but all the time that we're, we're treating it as if it only spoke to us in our time, uh, rather than having been written in another time at a very specific place in a very specific setting. For instance, the Bible is very clear. Clear about how all children of God are important, are loved, and, and there's an equality to the way that we, we understand our life together in Christ. So Paul writes about this. There's no Greek or Jew or, or slave or free or male or female. There's none of that distinction that we would place on things. But the Bible also presents a very historically grounded perspective on things like slavery. It talked about slavery in the first century, not in the 21st century, or perhaps the roles of women. Uh, for us to reject the scriptures, which many progressive people do, uh, because there's presenting a perspective that offends our modern sensibilities, well, that's, that's not a good idea. That's an anachronism. That's projecting a modern worldview back where it doesn't belong. And it also might be an anachronism to treat the Bible as if those historically grounded passages are universal in some way. Now, I'm not saying that there are not universal truths in the Scripture, that it's all relative. I would, I would never say that. There are absolutely universal truths. That's the whole purpose of the Bible, to offer us truth that transcends time, that goes beyond time, that can be lived and cherished at any point in human history. But I do think we need to have a little humility when it comes to reading the scriptures and be careful of these unseen or subtle anachronisms. As we look at this passage on, that Mark writes about, about healing, uh, this thought was sticking with me. Uh, it was almost nagging at me. How does this story about healing, uh, all the healing miracles of Jesus throughout the Gospels, how do they fit into our time? How do we understand them? What universal truth do they tell? Is my view of what's going on anachronistic? Um, I may not have all the answers to these questions, but I hope that we can together grab a hold of some truth nonetheless. In Colossians 4, that letter that Paul writes to the church in Colossae, in the very conclusion of that letter, he's, he's going through all the greetings, talking about all the folks that he was with who, who send their well wishes to the church there. In verse 14, he says that, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, sends his greetings. Now, from this, we know that Luke, uh, that companion of Paul, that author of a great big chunk of the New Testament in his gospel and the sequel, The Acts of the Apostles, was involved in some kind of healing profession. Now, the Greek word for doctor is iatros. Uh, that means one who heals, a mediciner. Uh, I like that word too, mediciner. Yeah. Better than our pharmacist, isn't it? We'd call him a mediciner. A physician, a surgeon. They didn't really make a lot of distinction between the healing professions like we do today. But I don't think that Luke was, uh, I, don't, I can't picture him as the kind of guy with the, lab, the white lab coat on and his, his name embroidered in it, Dr. Luke, the stethoscope over his shoulders. I can't see him as that. I don't think that's what he was. Somebody with years of medical school under his belt and a long internship before he practices medicine, that understanding would be an anachronism. In the first century, doctors weren't so revered as they are in our culture. Um, doctors were suspect. They were snake oil salesmen, uh, hucksters, uh, charlatans. Those that did have some beneficial knowledge were still constrained by their understanding of the time. They didn't know about things like infections or bacteria or germs in general. Now, I think Luke was legit. I don't think he was one of those fakers or frauds, but even Luke's knowledge could only go so far. He was certainly not a doctor in our modern understanding of the word. And medicine, medicine in the first century, healing in general, that was an entirely different world as well uh, for the Greeks. Uh, they, healing revolved around the god Asclepius. Asclepius. I said this like 50 times last night so that I wouldn't stumble over it, and I still did. Anyway, the god Asclepius was the son of Apollo and, and a human woman, Coronis, and uh, the legend goes that he received his knowledge when a snake whispered this secret wisdom into his ear about healing. 
Greek mythology. And I'm not going to talk much about Greek mythology. That's it. Basically, though, his story is typical death, jealousy, revenge, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's standard for that sort of story. What I do want to note is this, the, the presence of the Asclepion. The Asclepion was the healing temple. Uh, in, in the Greek world, it came, started about the 4th century, about 350 B.C., and came forward even into Jesus' time. And if you were sick, in part of that, that Greek culture, or even the Roman world, you had some kind of chronic condition, the place to go was, was an Asclepion. The Asclepion, the healing temple. But again, don't think of this healing temple as if it was like a modern hospital. It was absolutely nothing of the sort. It was completely different from what we would understand as a place of healing. See, the process was this. The process to achieve healing involved traveling to the Asclepion. That was usually a long journey. They only located them in certain places. Costly and a great distance for most folks. Cleansing yourself in some sort of purgative ritual, whether it be a special diet or ritual baths of some sort. And then making an offering, usually monetary. That, that may be similar to today, making that, that offering. But uh, anyway, then the patient would go into what was called the abaton, which was a, like a dormitory, and you'd lay down and you'd sleep. And during that time of sleeping, if you had a dream that the god Asclepion came to you in this dream, you would be healed. That's it. That's the process. Afterwards, if you had one of these dreams, you had to make another offering, a monetary, monetary offering. And, and let's be clear, if you didn't make a big enough offering or if you cheated them in some way, the cure gets revoked. So, again, maybe not entirely like our, our way of healing today, but... You can see from this, though, uh, the understanding of healing in the first century, it's a lot different than our understanding of healing today. This Greek idea, the, the Asclepion and the god Asclepius and the, and the way that worked, that was in the background, kind of in floating around in the air like it was for a, a lot of these Greek-influenced ideas. And then, if you were a Jew living in Palestine, you'd have a whole nother history and understanding of healing and sickness and infirmity and so forth. But, uh, in that, there was a connection for these folks, a very deep connection between the moral and the spiritual and the physical world. The lines between the body and the spirit were a lot more permeable for a first century Jew than they might be for us. We tend to separate those things out. Jews would have not gone to an Asclepion. That would have been against their faith, but they might have had a curiosity about it, particularly if they had some kind of chronic or, or uh, condition that they were suffering from. And then there was this profound conviction in those folks uh, lodged in their understanding of the Bible, the Levitical codes, that somehow there was a connection between sin and disobedience and sickness. But again, you know, if they read the Bible, they knew the story of Job, and uh, they were reasonably familiar with it, and they knew the story that even the righteous suffer at times and are sick. And all of these things would have been part of their understanding of what it meant to be sick and what it meant to be healed. Their, their worldview of, of, of what it meant to, to deal with this sort of stuff. And all of it would have been in Mark's readers' minds and his original audience. And their uh, thinking in, about this stuff would have been grounded in what they understood and not in thinking from 2,000 years in the future. So put yourself in their place. Go back in time and think about what it would be like to be this person who was being, receiving this gospel for the first time. So you're maybe a first century Jew, or perhaps you're a Gentile who had heard this gospel message and accepted to Jesus, and you receive a copy of, of Mark's gospel in the mail. I don't know how, they, how it got to you, but it got to you, and you're going to read it in the fellowship. You're going to crack it open. You're going to go through this and, and look at this, and you're going to see this account for the first time. Now, your perspective on things like healing was probably like this. Most of the folks were poor, okay? This, this is the fact. Most folks were poor, and so unless you were at the very upper echelon of society uh, to go to the Asclepion and, and, and get its resources, that was probably out of the question. You didn't have the time to travel. You didn't have the resources to travel there. The offerings, ridiculous, out of the question. So you probably just made do. When it, come to being, when it came to being sick. The doctors in your town, the, 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 the atros, uh, eh, maybe. Maybe they're, maybe they're quacks, maybe they're not, who knows. But uh, they, they're not doing a great job regardless. Uh, sometimes more harm than good. 
and because you've been part of this religious world, this religious upbringing, you, you, or because perhaps you've been spending some time with the Hebrew Scriptures, you, you, you've come to believe that there is this connection uh, between your spiritual health and your physical health, whatever that looks like. What it is is maybe not as clear, but you, you can't imagine that all these sick people that are running around are all bad people, but who knows? That's the question that's, that's floating around in the end, sickness and infirmity becomes a mystery. We don't know what causes it. We don't know why it's there. We don't know what's happening with it. Could be connected to moral failing, personal moral failing. Could be judgment. Could be discipline, uh, refining you into something better. It could be just something that happens. But certainly, it's beyond my control. I can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. The key understanding of sickness was that it took something divine to deal with it. Why did they go to a healing temple with a Greek god? Because we can't deal with it. We have to turn it over to something beyond us. So if this is the world that Mark is speaking into, then what does Mark say about Jesus? That's the key question. Let's take a look again at what Mark has said so far. And again, we're, we're not that far into the book yet. We're still in the first chapter. It won't take us much. This is the beginning. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus has come to John to be baptized. He goes down in the river. He comes out of the river. And we, we remember that story. The heavens are torn. The, the spirit descends in the form of a dove. The voice comes. This is my beloved Son. I'm, I, I'm pleased with him. So we get this affirmation of the Father in the process of Jesus being baptized. And then the wilderness temptation, Jesus triumphs over the tempter in the wilderness. And Mark is painting this very clear picture about who Jesus is, the wonder of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. And then after John the Baptist is arrested, he, he kind of leaves the stage, so to speak. Jesus comes and, and takes the forefront and says, I'm here to proclaim the good news the good news of God, that the kingdom is near and that we should re believe and repent. Repent and believe is the actual order there. But I want us to pay a particular attention to this, this section right here. Uh, this is at the very heart of what Jesus is doing. You see, Jesus doesn't come to be just another wonder worker. It's not about, you know, the circus sideshow. Jesus doesn't come just to perform miracles. He doesn't come to just be a sage, a wise person teaching, teaching good ideas. He doesn't come just to cast out demons or to calm storms. He doesn't come just to heal. Jesus comes to proclaim the good news. That's the core of what Jesus is doing. And yeah, all this stuff is encompassed in that, but the main focus here is the good news. Now I want to unpack that a little bit, that idea of the good news, uh, proclaiming the kingdom of God for a moment. Mark, again, pop, 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 pop. He's moving from one thing to the next. He's not spending a lot of time in one place. There is no moss growing on Mark. We're going through this quickly. He doesn't really want to, to talk about the, the content as much as he wants to talk about Jesus. So he moves from this statement that Jesus is proclaiming the good news right on to the calling of the first disciples. And, and, and so we're, we're moving through this story pretty quickly. So we need to take a pause here. I want you to keep your finger in the Mark passage, but flip to Luke. Luke chapter 4 is where I'd like you to go for a moment. In Luke chapter 4, Luke takes another story and slots it in there. Mark's, Mark doesn't, doesn't share this story with us, but he it may have happened before the calling of the four fishermen, it may, or perhaps after, but it was certainly something that happened before Jesus went to that Capernaum synagogue. So we got Jesus proclaiming the good news, and we got the Capernaum synagogue, and, and Luke has this other story in there. Now, I mentioned this before. Mark's not concerned about what, telling us what Jesus taught. That may be why he, he moves past this, but Luke does. Luke offers us a little exposition, a little explanation of what Jesus is getting at when he comes to proclaim the good news. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, and he reads this passage from Isaiah. They hand him the scroll and he unrolls it and he reads this, this text from Isaiah. And the, what he reads from Isaiah is really describing what is at the heart of of the gospel, what is at the, the very center of this message that Jesus comes to proclaim. 
it is, it is what Jesus is proclaiming when he proclaims the good news of the kingdom. And you either have it there or you remember it. The quotation from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus takes that prophecy from Isaiah and says, this is me. He says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's happening right now, he says. And so this is the content of Jesus' message and teaching that Mark assumes that his reader already has heard and understood and accepted, that Jesus, in proclaiming this good news, is proclaiming a new order, a new kingdom, a new world that is breaking into the old world, one in which oppression, in all of its forms, even the oppression of sickness, is overcome. That's the good news. Now, this is one of the differences between Mark's original reader and perhaps how we might think of this overcoming the oppression of sickness today. See, we've taken physical health and we put it over here. And we've taken spiritual health and we put it over here. And we've separated those two things into two different worlds. You see, when it comes to our physical health, do we go to church? Maybe. We might ask for some prayer. We might kind of invite that. But we're going to depend on doctors and hospitals and science and medicine quite a bit with this. And let's be honest, it is a lot better than the first century, okay? They're, we're able to do some things now that, that would have been magical to the people in the first century. It may cost about the same, but it's, it's definitely better quality. And... We leave the spiritual health, our, our spiritual well-being, to religion. We separated these two things, but Jesus didn't view it that way. Mark didn't view it that way. It's unlikely that the audience that, that they were speaking to would have as well. Jesus is interested not in a separate entities, but in the whole person, the entirety of a person, body, mind, and soul. And Mark's original readers would have, would have probably understood that same unity of the body and the mind and the soul at least better than we do. And they probably would have had no idea whatsoever how God could work through science, the science of medicine, to heal people. But the point of the passage isn't really that. It's not really the, the method or manner of healing that, that we see as if we might find a cure to our modern maladies here in the text. Mark's not telling us, well, here's how Jesus heals so you can apply it here to your infirmity in your place in your time, whatever it is you're facing, as if it were just some other ritual or incantation that the, that the Greeks were doing to make sick people well. That's what a modern reader might be tempted to do because of the way that we've separated that physical from the spiritual reality of our health. Passages on healing in the Bible, well, they're about the body. They're about the, the physical part. The more spiritual passages, they're separate. They're over here. They're about the soul. But that's a modern way of thinking. That's an anachronism that we might be projecting because to a significant extent back then everything was tied together body soul it's all one unit to hear about how Jesus heals the body is to understand how Jesus has power over everything so reading this passage looking at it through the lens of a first century reader it, it might just give you a little different idea Something might come up that we wouldn't see otherwise. What Mark's doing here, what he's still doing here, I mean, it's, it's begun from the very first verse until now. What Mark is still doing is talking about who Jesus is. When you consider all of the scope of Jesus' healing miracles, okay, consider all four Gospels now and think of everything that Jesus did to heal people. And how Jesus healed people. He, he, you know, healing them with a touch. Here with, with, with Simon's mother-in-law, he just takes her by the hand and lifts her up. So he can do it that way. Or maybe with spit. Or maybe with mud made out of spit. Or maybe he tells them to go and wash in a pool. Or maybe he says from a distance he can heal. Maybe he comes close to them and heals. Maybe it's just a word. All you have to do is touch his garment and be healed. 
When you consider all the scope of the way that Jesus healed, it is impossible for us to work out a pattern to say that's how it works. We can't copy that. That's Jesus' work. We can't treat the gospel account as it, of, he, of his healing ministry as some kind of a medical manual or a, or a playbook on healing today. The point isn't, well, how does Jesus heal so that we can, we can embrace that same sort, of, same sort of process? The point is this, Jesus heals. Jesus heals. This is another in a long line of Christological passages in which Mark is telling us about Jesus, about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. He's showing Jesus' character by his actions. And in a world that blended the physical and the, and the material and the spiritual all together, Jesus, who throws out a demon in the previous passage, who heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law simply by taking her hand and lifting her up here, who heals all those people that come to him in the evening time. That's, that's a great picture, can't you think? It's like, oh, I, know, I heard Jesus is down here, and they all show up, and they're all outside of the house, and, and, and Simon Peter probably looks out the window and goes, yeah, they're here. But Jesus goes out and heals of various diseases and, and casts out demons and all of that. In all of it, Jesus is doing one simple thing, claiming authority over everything. He not only has the authority to interpret and apply Scripture appropriately, verse 22, verse 27 in the first chapter there, he's not only the one that can cast out demons, Jesus has authority over sickness and fevers and infirmities of all kinds. Jesus is telling us again that Jesus, Mark is telling us again that Jesus is Lord of all, the very Son of God who will redeem all things. I love this story. This is a great story. This is one of the, one of the stories that in, in Mark's gospel that made people think that Mark may have gotten his material directly from Peter because this is a vignette of something that happens right there in Simon Peter's house. I mean, this is very personal, it's very intimate, it's got really neat details in it. It's a lot of points in there, but getting hung up on some of these more peripheral points in the passage, it, it may be a reflection of the way that we want to see it, the way we might project our modern thinking back onto this original story. Not that there's not truth to be found in all those details, uh, we actually gain a lot from the secondary points, but we shouldn't miss the main point the main point, and we can best do that when our worldview doesn't show up as an anachronism in the passage. How many of you, when, you read, when we read this passage, how many of you, and you can raise your hand if you want, were a little bit troubled that Simon's mother-in-law is healed just in time to make dinner? Did that bother you a little bit? I could almost picture this. It's Simon Peter they go into the house. Simon pulls Jesus aside and says, uh, hey, Jesus, uh, mom's in bed again, uh, uh, and there's no sandwiches. And I, I, do you think maybe you could do something about that, help out there, maybe a little healing? Well, there's plenty to talk about there. There could be a whole series of sermons on that, gender roles and respect and honor in, the, in that culture and, and what it means to be a true follower of Jesus who came to serve and not to be served. So who is really following Jesus in this text? A lot to talk about there. But that's not the point that Mark's trying to make. Any more than the symbolism of fevers is the point or the, the Jesus commands the demons to keep silent is the point. Yeah, those are important things to look at and it's all there for sure, but Mark might end up a little bit frustrated with us if we spend too much time on those points and miss the central point about who Jesus is because of what Jesus does. And who Jesus is, manifest in his actions, is just as important today as it was then. This is not an anachronism. This is a universal truth. We need to understand, deeply understand, who Jesus is if we're going to be faithful to Jesus. And Jesus is a healer. And there are miracles. Even today, there are miracles of healing. Wondrous things that have no rational explanation. I believe it. 
But if we see Jesus as just a healer, as just a doctor, as just someone who can replace the charlatans and the quacks of our time and provide us with a robust physical health, then we're missing out on the whole picture. We need to see more than that. The good news is good not just for our body, but for our soul as well. And this kingdom that he is pronouncing, the one that has come near, that is a place where all things are healed. And that is good news indeed. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we hear this story, and it is a rich story full of very intimate details. But we pray that our hearts and our minds would be able to see it as you intend us to see it, as a testimony to the power and the authority of Jesus. We don't know how these miracles occurred. We can't conceive of the power that Jesus has over all the realms of earth, the body, the mind, the spirit, the soul, all those things Jesus has sovereignty over. But we do know that it happens. We see it in the text. Many of us have experienced it in our lives. We know that you love us and want the best for us, to be whole and complete in all ways. We pray for patience when the healing doesn't come in the way that we would want it to. We pray for grace to face the days that may be touched with infirmity. We pray for faith that we might believe that you will heal us according to your good purpose. Lord, all these things you call us to. But more than anything, Lord, we pray that you would allow us to recognize Jesus and follow him faithfully in all things. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We have an opportunity to share in communion today. And did you get a few more? Okay. <laughs> I, we had a relatively large group for uh, our early service, and uh, so we kind of, and we got a fairly decent group here today, too. So it's going to be good to share together. Um, I want to just let you know again a little bit about our process here. We're going to just give you the bread and the cup, which you will take back to your uh, seat and just hold it for a moment. Um, I, you know, I struggle, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with it because I think that in, in sharing the elements with each other, there's deep spiritual significance to that, and I feel like we're kind of maybe skipping over that point. So we will take a moment to center once we've returned to our seats with the bread and the cup. Uh, we'll do some, some reflection and some prayer at that time, but uh, it is a blessing to be able to share this, not only physically with you here, but uh, spiritually with brothers and sisters who are not in this place right now. So um, the first part will be logistics, coming forward, receiving the bread and cup, taking your seat again, and once everybody is served, we will uh, we'll go through and delve into the spiritual aspect of this physical reality. So, Andrew, if you'd come and help me. So if you would, see if I can do this with my mic on. <laughs> come forward and... Uh, just maybe roll at a time. You guys are professionals. You can do this. So come on up and get a cup and a bread. Yep.
Well done. <laughs> oh, and you probably couldn't see my smile just to see everyone come up and do this. We do need to take a moment and get ourselves back into that frame of mind. So uh, take a breath. Think about Jesus, sacrifice, the wonder of it all. And it is truly amazing. Printed on the back of your bulletins will be our readings. All believers are invited to this table in the name of the one who said, I am the bread and the life. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is here that we remember how he gave his body and his blood to save us. But because this is no ordinary meal, we should prepare our hearts and our minds to its significance and its power. I invite you to take some time of silent reflection, some prayer, examine your relationship with Jesus and with your brothers and sisters. Prepare your hearts, if you would bow with me. It began this way. 
On the night that he was handed over, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us, even unto death. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink at your table in our congregation and around the world are one body, one holy people. May we be inspired and equipped by this holy meal. The bread of life, Jesus' body, broken for you. Let's take it together. After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let us pray together. Lord, give us clean hearts, forgiving hearts, praising hearts, As we drink this, we join with our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth, giving thanks to you in an endless song of praise. May this cup remind us of your ever-flowing love. Amen. The blood of Christ was shed for you. How we take it? Join me in this closing prayer. We have come to your table, Lord, and in taking the bread and the cup, we have received a special gift. In remembering, we have come close to you. We have tasted your infinite love. May your spirit transform us from within so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, speak with Jesus' mouth, Feel the world as Jesus feels, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Lead us into the world, nourished by the bread of life. We pray in the name of the one who gave body and blood, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Praise, I will praise you, Lord, all my heart. O God of hell, the wonders of your ways, and glorify your name. I will praise you, Lord, all my heart. <clears throat> I Source of all my joy, hallelujah. Great love, I will love you, Lord, is all my heart. O oh God, I will tell the wonders of your ways, glorify.
serve, I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart. Oh, God, tell the wonders of your ways and glorify me. Bow with me once again. Lord, these are your people, your children, both those gathered here in this place and as we are reminded today as we take communion scattered throughout the world, we pray that you would bless each one in the place that they find themselves. Give them a special understanding of your goodness and grace today. And wherever we are, Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to speak your name boldly, to proclaim that good news that Jesus began. Take us into the world to be a salt and light, to shine your love into all the dark corners. Bless these, your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace.